up to worship God with you guys this morning. Uh, it's great to, to have the Honolulu boys join us today. Off Lobby, Darius, Austin. Uh, you guys, uh, you guys are always welcome to come join us anytime. But, uh, but uh, Thanksgiving was great, huh? Uh, so great to, uh, to just eat food, honestly. Eat food and spend time with you guys. Uh, one of my favorite things to do. And uh, Thanksgiving, when it comes to Thanksgiving, you have, you have choices on choices on choices. Uh, just like every food occasion that we have with the family. Uh, but it was good that Robbie brought those like little separation trays for the people that like don't like to, their food to touch. But you want so much of it all on there at once. I like the fusion. I just like a little bit of this and that in one bite. And, uh, just, and just try and just dabble a little bit. It's, it's an art, eating, you know? But, uh, but when it comes to decisions, uh, there's so many decisions in life to make. And uh, today I'm going to preach on making a godly decision. That's my title today, making a godly decision. Let's pray to God before we jump into it. Uh, thank God for this day. Thank you so much for the holiday seasons uh, upon us. Uh, so thankful to know that you have lived and died for us and that we can live uh, this life to the full. And know that knowing that your, your birthday is coming up, God, uh, we're excited for that. And we're excited to, to be family and spend time with each other because that's what it's all about. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Making a godly decision. All right. So as a guest, how many times do you think the average human being makes uh, decisions every single day? Ten, a hundred, a thousand, hundred. Let's try more. Oh. Try thirty-three thousand. Oh. Try thirty-five thousand. Each day, uh, kids kids only do about three thousand decisions a day, and so that's why they you know they probably complain about not all the options that they get. <laughs> they don't get to decide as much, right? Uh, it's nice to be a kid. The parents kind of just decide everything for you, right? Uh, but as humans, as adults, uh, we have some decisions to make. And just recently, uh, I've been going through this with uh, the shepherds. This might ring a bell a little bit. Uh, and this has uh, really helped us, really helped me to look inward at myself and uh, my pitfalls in my relationship with God as well as in my marriage. So this is a book for, for the singles, so you guys know. It's a, a book for engaged couples. But uh, you're going to see this pretty soon here, Katie and Alira. But uh, as married couples, like this is super valuable. We get to look at this for the rest of our lives, and it just helps us understand us a little bit. And uh, uh, some disciples wrote this. So it's nice that there's some scriptures ingrained into it. And so, so today I wanted to preach on one of the chapters, if that's okay with you guys. And so we're, uh, yeah, decisions. We've got a lot of decisions to make. You know, when to go to bed, when to, uh, you know, you do recreational time, when to do hobbies, when to make, what to do in our budget, what kind of gifts we give for Christmas, uh, where we meet for Thanksgiving, right? We have a lot of different uh, situations and uh, decisions to make as people. And so when, when two parties, when two people come together or, you know, as relationships, um, and those two people have different interests or ideas, then the decisions become not only more noticeable, but also more challenging. And so as disciples, you know, we worship God together and we have relationships nonetheless. So whether we're married or single, this is very applicable to all of us today. And uh, as of next week, um, I have the privilege of celebrating our one-year anniversary with my wonderful, beautiful wife right over here. And, uh, and so as long as you guys have known us, we've known each other. Wait. As being married. Yeah, so that, that's it. And uh, in the same way, as long as I've known Katie and Alira, you know, they, they've been dating. And uh, now they're engaging, man. But, uh, but, but when, you, when we come together as people, like, we have to learn and understand the patterns that we have. And uh, my wife is still learning my patterns, and I'm still learning her patterns. And, uh, and even though we've been here for, for a full year, we're still learning each other's patterns. And so we are still um, establishing uh, what it, really what it means to be able to be more effective on not only worshiping God, but also worshiping God together as a family. And so... 
Um, when it comes to, to eating food, sometimes there's a lot of decisions to being made. Amen? Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the, the most difficult one is what to eat after church. Amen? Yeah. Uh, where to eat. And uh, I know usually the sisters have a little bit more tough time with that decision right there. The, the brothers are like, I don't care as long as I get some food, right? <laughs> uh, I saw a meme once, something about like how, how Eve like ruined it all, like back in the day when she made the decision to eat. And it ruined for the entire humanity for, for the women to make decisions on what to eat. <laughs> it's a joke, it's a joke, all right? Gosh. All right. Uh, tough crowd. But, uh, but I meant, but as, as people, like, when it comes to the Word of God, we'll eat whatever it is in here as disciples. And uh, we're equal in that front of it. But the goal is to learn to make decisions that are mutually satisfying for everyone. And so thanks, for, thanks to Randall Alexander right here. Uh, we're going to dive into this, and we're going to do a bit of a, a case study on a decision that uh, put Jesus to death. So we're going to Matthew chapter 26. And before the decision to put him to death, Judas played a, a, a pivotal role on arresting Jesus. And so we're going to, as a case study, as a good detective does, he starts um, at one of the more recent clues and he works backwards. So we're going to read Matthew 26, verse 14. The Bible says, Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, What are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 silver coins. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. So Judas had made a decision to be able to betray Jesus at this point of time. And so Satan can really get into our hearts uh, to betray Jesus in our own lives. In the same way, uh, Satan can, can, can rule any government of people if he gets into to people's lives. And so people can be bought. Why? Because they can be bought at a price. Unless, of course, we're sold out for Jesus right there. And so we got to ask ourselves, what is our breaking point for sin in our lives? It could be different for, for the, every different circumstance. Um, if someone offers you a uh, million dollars, would you, would you steal? If someone offers you a hundred million dollars, would you steal? What if uh, some, one of your family members is uh, in jeopardy for their life? Would you be willing to steal to help that, that family member? So these are some tough decisions that we all have to make. And what makes it add to the pot of a decision is when we add bitterness within our hearts. And so Judas at this time, he had a bitter heart and he was willing to sell out Jesus for as little as 30 silver coins, which is the price of a, of a cheap slave. But what made Judas be this way? Well, we saw through the whole Gospels, really um, an account of many different things he did. But we'll look at the more recent account, just a couple scriptures before this in verse 6. It says, While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money giver, the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. And so Satan has a way of conspiring through one's selfish motives. Uh, I really appreciate uh, Sammy sharing um, and being open, just being like, you know, deep down sometimes I, I have a selfishness, and I could totally agree to that on many different fronts. And so Satan is working through Judas in a way that he can work through each one of us through our own motives. And we see here that the disciples were indignant. Um, what's cool is that every account in the gospel has this account, this story, and it shows that it wasn't just the disciples. It wasn't just Judas, but it was also the Pharisees and the elite that were all indignant about something that wasn't even sin. It was actually a debatable matter. And so how did Jesus respond? He, he looked at them and he discipled them right on the spot, right? And, uh, and we know that in the, the book of John, in this account, it says that he didn't even, that Judas didn't even care about helping the poor, but rather he did it for himself. 
And so Judas, who was self-focused at this time, became more embittered because why? Because he was corrected. He was discipled on the spot. And what did that lead to? His next move to betraying uh, Jesus, probably his best friend. And so I've had moments of this where I've been corrected in my life. And have you ever been corrected on your motives before? It's like, it's, it's deep waters right there, right? And, uh, you know, I like to think that, like, I'm a good person, but deep down I know that I'm not because I'm human. And so when it comes to the motives, I could be quick to being defensive and to defend uh, really my motives. But really, that's just the wickedness trying to remain in the flesh right there. And so Satan also has a way of conspiring through the hearts of the religious. So let's read verse 3. We'll back up just a little bit more. Matthew 26, verse 3. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose names was Caiaphas. And they plotted to arrest Jesus in some sly way, then killed him. But not during the feast, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. So we see here that they're conspiring, and, and we can say, we can look at this, and we know how it ends, and we can think, wow, like, men have a way to scheme and a way to defy God, the living God. But we have to remember that God is allowing all of this to happen for a reason. And so uh, we also have to note that the man who, who plotted the arrest of Jesus here is Caiaphas, which is the chief priest. And we're going to see how that plays in a role later on. But for too many of us, interacting with our family, especially during holidays, uh, friends and even characters in the Bible, it's taught us how not to make the godly decisions in our lives. And so too often decision-making sessions involve manipulation, intimidation, selfishness, arrogance, shouting, cry, crying, uh, fake tears, and total emotional shutdown. And good decision-making, however, uh, discussions leave us feeling valued and respected. And here's the thing, even when we didn't get what we wanted, we can feel good about the decision because we know that we voluntarily sacrificed something that we want for a win-win situation. But, but bad decision making will leave us feeling anxious, insecure, guilty, or even used. And so when we get what we want, but we might not feel good about it, that's the worst, right? When we, when we win like an argument or a situation and we got what we want, but it just, it just wasn't worth it at all. And so the first step in decision making is identify the decision. And that first is called the discovery phase. There's three phases. The discovery phase. So point number one, discovery phase. So we got to ask ourselves, what is the decision that we need to make? And what does everybody want in the situation? And we must be clear and not have hidden agendas. And then we got to ask ourselves, why do we want these things? And it's helpful to explain rather than to uh, assume. And we also have to ask ourselves, whatever situation is decided, how much does it matter to us? Because if it doesn't matter that to us that much and someone else makes the decision, then we can get behind it more easily and it just doesn't really matter. And we can easily get behind the flow of things. But here's the thing, we can change situations that we decide now later on. And so um, there's a couple of pitfalls during the discovery phase. I'm going to share some of those pitfalls with all of us. And so um, some of those pitfalls are re reacting negatively to others with body language. Right? So I'm pretty confident that Judas wasn't smiling and he wasn't walking around prideful and excited. Um, the second one was asking for more than you want for additional bargain, bargaining power. And so uh, the religious people, they didn't just want to try Jesus in court. They didn't want to just beat him up. They wanted to give him the ultimate death penalty on the cross. In the same way, Judas, he was tried for, uh, he tried leveraging the poor of all people to get what he wanted. And uh, so obviously he didn't care much before, but all of a sudden, you know, now he cares. And then the third aspect is not sharing what we want for fear that it will be rejected. And so instead of Judas sharing in his heart uh, the dark matters and like getting open with Jesus, instead he, he, betrayed his, uh, he betrayed his best friend. He just left. 
And so maturity is found in getting resolved no matter what fear is necessary in order to get resolved in those matters with each other. Um, and th that can be difficult at times, but that's what's going to uh, create a, a character that's going to keep us uh, safe for the rest of our lives. And then uh, number four is uh, feeling that our companion's request cannot be refused. We could be afraid of sharing if we feel like we're going to be rejected. And the fifth one is spending your time figuring out how you will get what you want. And so we understand that the chief priests, they, they got together. They had their unity meeting right here. They assembled, and so did Judas. And uh, I can do this without the other people. I can do this within my own heart. I can have a little, a little discussion in my own heart to be able to save my, my flesh without realizing the wickedness behind of my intentions. And so I have to be aware of those types of things. And that's why it helps to, to share the, our thoughts. And so the second phase is the discussion phase. Um, that's the fun one. So in Matthew chapter 27, verse 57, we're going to see how Jesus was dis discussed on what they were going to do with him. 27, verse 57. So those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could, be, they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. And so the very same man, Caiaphas, who... Um, decided that, that they needed to take Jesus down is the same judge who was going to condemn him to, to being beaten and to death. And so we have to understand that injustice reigns when the accuser is also the judge. And that's what creates a narcissistic attitude in, in this case. And so coming to a consensus before deliberately discussing with the other party is what can make me make rash decisions myself. And so Proverbs 18, verse 17 says, In a lawsuit, the first to speak seems right until someone comes forward and cross-examines. And so here's the goal. Out of everything, what I've said is basically we need to make an agreement, uh, make agreement be our goal in how we make a deciding factor. So it's impossible if I already decided in my heart that I'm already right before going into the conversation, right? And so... Uh, they shared in this book that um, some approach the discussion phase as an opportunity to prove that what they want is the only conclusion a thinking moral person with any common sense would do. So he says that the thinking, this kind of thinking is arrogant and foolish. And so I, I made sure to circle that part because I was like, that, that reminds me of myself right there. Um, and so as a husband, uh, I've done this. As a, as a parent, I've done this. And even as a, as a friend, as a disciple. So verse 61, it says, uh, and declared, the fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is the testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, prophesy to us, Christ, who hits you? And so we, we have to remember that opinions are different than morals and ethics and even logic. And so here their opinion was that Jesus was blasphemous because he equated himself equal to God. And so this made them really mad. And so they were filled with a lot of emotion, which led to the immediate physical abuse and judgment of Jesus. And so though we might not get physically abusive, we could be emotionally or isolation, just a different, bunch of different types of abuse that we can do with one another um, by, based off of our emotions. And so we see here that Caiaphas, 
he only accepted two witnesses to come forward. So the law was you need a minimum of two witnesses to make a decision. And they weren't just any witnesses, the, they were false witnesses. Right. And uh, what's cool is in, in the kingdom of God, we get to have each other to get advice about anything, literally anything in our lives. And so I, I looked up this rule, there's a rule called the rule of seven. And so according to the auth authors of the book, Five Steps to Breakthrough Performance in Your Organization, it says that once you've got seven people in a decision-making group, each additional reduces decisions effectiveness by 10%. So it's good to get advice, but if you get advice from more than seven people, it starts to be a little bit less, uh, less, less effective, which I thought that was pretty interesting. According to statistics, anyways. So in Proverbs 15, 22, it says plans succeed uh, when you uh, ask many advisors, right? And so the goal of Proverbs 15 is that we, when we pool our thinking, we can become more wiser. And we can, uh, we also must, however, be willing to be persuaded by the advice that we get. That's the hard part. Um, so my application today is, when we're, when we're in a situation, in a decision, imagine doing exactly what the other person has purposed and thinking about how to make it work. Not just what is wrong with it, which is hard for me, um, but fully consider their point of view, even if they do not consider your own, right? So, man, if, even if they don't consider your own, like trying to make it work, and that's what it means to being agreeable. So, um, but in this, in this case, we saw that there was an emotional uh, decision made uh, that we know that it worked out because God was in control of it all, but um, we can make some emotional uh, buying decisions in our lives, can't we? I don't know if anybody like did any Black Friday deals this year. A little bit. Some last minute Mary Monarch deals maybe. Like those, those are the big ones. I feel like those ones are the bigger ones than the Black Friday deals in Hawaii, right? Um, but I saw this, this, this good idea. It said there's a 72-hour rule for non-essential purchases where before you make the decision to buy, you just wait 72 hours. And this will shift from the emotional part of the brain to the logical part. And uh, I, thought, I thought this would be a good way to keep us in line with uh, our budgets, amen. Uh, Matthew 26, verse 69 says, Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him. You also were a Jesus of Galilee, she said. So I want to touch on this briefly, just because Peter here, we see that he's sitting out in the courtyard, um, the very same place where Jesus is being tried. But at the courtyard, He's closer to the high priest, the accuser, who's trying him than he is to Jesus himself. So when we are physically or spiritually closer towards the accuser than Jesus, it's harder for us to make good decisions in our lives that are godly decisions, no matter how close we were just recently. And so there's some pitfalls uh, during the discussion phase. I'm going to share that with you. I got eight different pitfalls. So you got your notes ready? All right. So not listening to the other's reasoning and requests, right? Focus only on what you want. Uh, dramatic presentation of your side. Uh, raising your voice. Using inflammatory words like you always, you never. Um, attacking the other with insults. Shutting down, such as saying well, whatever you want. And then crying manipulative tears. So those are some pitfalls that we can run into while trying to come up with a discussion. And so the other day I had the opportunity of going to Mauna Kea with some of the brothers. And uh, that, was, that was a lot of fun. It was, it was an easy decision to want to go, because everybody wants, you know, wants to go. But, uh, but the cost of, of what it takes to, to get there, to, you need four wheel drive to get to the top. And uh, thanks to Quinn, uh, Quinn drove us all the way to the summit right there. And, uh, and you're putting your, your, your vehicle in like a bit of a, a tough decision, you know? You don't want to just take every car that you have that can make it up there. And, um, and some of the Kona disciples were planning on meeting us up there at, this, at the uh, visitor center. But uh, they made a tough decision. Instead of uh, joining us and witnessing God's glory at the very top of the hill, uh, they decided not to come because uh, one of the sisters, one of the moms got baptized in Kona instead, right? And so, so though both decisions were good, uh, they chose the, the more gothy decision. 
Uh, and so for us, uh, we made up for it. We, we said some prayers as well when we were up there. And there's nothing like, like praying to God when you're literally closest to God that you'll ever yeah. physically be, amen? And um, so the pictures were amazing. Uh, there's like literally no life up there except for like a little beetle that somehow does its thing. Yeah, it's got, yeah, pretty cool. But, uh, but yeah, I guess so I learned from this that like I don't have to wait around in the courtyard like, like Peter. I can make a decision to follow Jesus no matter whether I hear true evidence or false evidence shared, I can act like Jesus now by being humbly and defenseless in my attitude when it comes to my uh, relationships with people. And so we see that in, in Philippians chapter 2. One of my favorite scriptures about attitude. Philippians 2 verse 1. So um, this is a great practical that the book gave me and that um, I can remember while I feel like um, my blood can start to boil when, when I'm in a, an altercation. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 says, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider each other better than yourselves. Each of you should, not, should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And so uh, as we're going up, uh, Darius, like right before we got like checked out, Darius is like, uh, I, I have a headache. <laughs> oh, dang. Amen, bro. Well, we want to make sure you're good. So we're like, we're, we're like, he's like, all right, I'm good, bro. I'm like, are you sure? So like, we were trying to look out for the interests of our brother right there uh, while doing something we wanted to do. Um, but one of the other decisions that we had to make was like, you know, are we, Carlos wanted to climb to the top. He wanted to, to, to summit it. And uh, as soon as we got out of the truck and we started walking around, we realized that wasn't a good, that wouldn't have been a good idea. Because like we were super lightheaded and like disoriented. I thought I was the only one at first and I was like, man, I'm weak. And we started talking to each other. We were all like lightheaded. I was looking around, there's like hundreds of people up there. I'm like, everybody right now is probably the only way. Um, and then we all, we all have great decisions to make. Uh, point number three, the decision phase. Matthew chapter 27, verse 24. Matthew 27, verse 24. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, let his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to, to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to being crucified. So Pilate had the most crazy decision out, out of everybody. He was the, the Roman uh, governor at the time, and he decided to be indecisive and not make a decision. And so even an indecision is still a decision. And so we can see through Pilate's indecision that unresolved problems still can lead to death. Uh, point number one, uh, the first aspect of a decision phase is learning, learn to be decisive. Learn to be decisive. So sometimes, because of time, we are forced to decide more quickly than we want to. Uh, but to do this, to make decisions, uh, for me, like, I must trust God through the process. I have to trust that God's going to take care of me when I'm unable to do, um, even if we're going to do something that I don't think is even best. Um, Luke chapter 6, verse 38 says, Give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be, me it will be measured to you. And so we can know that, that we're going to be taken care of by God when we are taking care of God's business on our ends. And so this works not only in our relationship with God, but also in our relationships with one another. All right, so the second point of, the second aspect of learning to be decisive is to own the decision. So this can be difficult for myself. So uh, finally, we must make uh, the decision. And once the decision is made, we must we must both stick to that and own that decision. And so we can't think that doing what the other one wanted removes our responsibility for the decision. 
And so we have to own it just as though it was our wish or our intention or our idea to make the decision. And so I can lack maturity when, <clears throat> when I, or get a bitter heart when it's not my idea or my preference in the matter, even though I am submitting to it, right? But really, I'm really not, right, in my heart. And so the third aspect is persuade, but do not force. Um, my, my favorite part about the Hilo Church is this is what we, we live by, you know. Well, our goal is to persuade one another in Christ to live for him, but not to force anybody that they don't want to do. And so we're all adults here. We, you know, we all make our own decisions. Uh, but we all must be persuaded because our hearts are, are, are led by persuasion. And Paul says, you know, I'm not here to preach on using um, wise or fancy words, but rather persuading by his own conviction and by the Holy Spirit that works within us. And so we might not have everything our way, but we will strengthen the relationship, which is far more important than any decision. And so for that reason, we, that's why we've decided that, that we're going back to Arizona. And uh, since then, I've been, I've been tempted with like thinking like, oh, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe that wasn't the right decision, you know, thinking like that. Um, but I always have to remember um, really like and stand by the decision that I made, amen? And uh, I, everything like within all my heart, I wanted to come up here like the guy in Wolf of Wall Street where he's like about to get shut down by the government. And he like gets in the mic and he's like, no, we're not leaving. <laughs> Stratton, we're going. You know? Uh, cause, just because I love you guys uh, so much, and I'm grateful for all of our relationships. Why? Because, because of the sacrifice involved, you know, everything that we've given up uh, to be disciples, you know, what you guys have given up and what we've given up, there's so much um, tied beyond that, that bond between all of us. And so uh, we've uh, vowed to make the best decision so that we can further advance God's kingdom uh, right here in Hilo. And, uh, you know, I look forward to seeing what God is going to do within the next coming months. Uh, so I have some final tips for you guys before I close out here. The last final tips for good, godly decision making are as follows. And I had to keep these ones in mind when making my decision. Remember that your relationship is more important than the decision. Follow the process without focusing on the outcome. Think what is best for us, not for me. Being solution-oriented to find a way that will work. Be persuadable. Stay calm. Use conversation voice. Avoid inflammatory remarks. Use constructive language and accept the final decision as your own. And so I believe that if, even if we just exercise just one of these points, we will be able to be that much more godly and make more awesome decisions for God and his kingdom and your relationship with God. So by being empowered to make godly decisions at just the right time, we can be part of a healthy and thriving church here in Hilo, no matter the spiritual climate beyond these walls. I love you guys. To God be all the glory.